In our continuation of a three-part series on Christian magic, Deacon Michael Stroyan joins us to talk about the middle period of Christian magic, uh, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So stick around and we'll talk all about it coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi everybody, I'm Father Tony Sylvia. Jonathan Stewart is on assignment in the uh, frozen tundra uh, gathering data uh, for the coming apocalypse or something. I don't know. Anyway, so tonight we're going to be talking about Christian magic as part two of a three-part series with Deacon Michael Stroyan. Uh, Deacon, hello and welcome back. Thank you very much, Father Tony. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing well, doing well. All right, so uh, the first part of this was early Christian magic. We talked about kind of the early period of Christianity and what all went down uh, at that time. So we're going to zoom forward a couple of years. We're going to talk about uh, the Middle Ages and uh, the Renaissance and stuff like that uh, with magic in, in, Christian, in Christendom at the time. So um, w what happened between the time of the early Christian magic and the uh, Middle Ages? Did, did the crystallization of uh, what would become Orthodox Christianity, did, how did that affect the magical traditions? Strangely, um, very little, very little. Um, after the legalization of Christianity and the establishment of a Christian empire uh, through Rome, they ended up basically consolidating some of the old Justinian uh, codes and Roman and Greek and whatnot prescriptions against magic. So magic was still very much an illegal uh, pursuit. But if you were smart and couched it in theology or history, you might not get burnt at the stake. <laughs> so, uh, what were they? What were they practicing at the time? These these smart people uh, were were the, was it kind of a, a folk magic tradition, or, or are we talking more of a uh, ritualized uh, ceremonial magic stuff at this time? You see a lot of crossover um, in the ninth century. Um, there were still pockets of paganisms in Europe. And these continued as folk magical practices that eventually would take on a Christian veneer. And oftentimes you find, for example, in Northern Europe, Scandinavia, a blending of Christian concepts as well as pagan concepts. This could be in formulas that are invoking Odin and Thor or substituting them for Jesus and various other divine figures from Christian mythology. And the more urban settings, you find uh, the practice of what's called natural magic and is basically pursued as a science. So, for example, at this point, astrology is actually not so much separate from medicine, is not separate from magic. You just don't do magic with astrology or try to predict the future with it because otherwise you're in league with the devil. That naturally didn't stop anyone and you have copious examples of astrologers performing various different activities of divination for royalty and also for the average layperson. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you have practices such as geomancy that were reabsorbed into Europe or introduced into Europe from the Arab world with the translations of various Arabic magic texts as well as the resurgence of interest in Western philosophy that was nominally lost uh, and the end of the classical era and retranslated back into Latin or Greek from either Greek or Arabic. Mm -hmm. So this is a time, uh, especially the early Middle Ages, where um, literacy isn't such a big deal <laughs> for, uh, for, for most people and it's, it's the kind of educated uh, clergy that, that end up translating and, and perpetuating a lot of these things. Uh, do we see a lot of members of the clergy who are uh, practicing this kind of magic, or at least perpetuating it in, uh, through translation and whatnot? We have quite a few examples of clergy that, if even if they weren't actively practicing it, definitely had a knowledge of what they were doing. Uh, probably the most famous example would be um, Roger Bacon, who was the teacher of the famed uh, Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, Johannes Trithemius in Germany, a Benedictine monk, cryptographer, and 
ostensibly a magician who would eventually give rise to a lot of what we see in Enochiania later on, mm -hmm. as well as the three books of occult philosophy that would have been consolidated by Cornelius Agrippa. Then you also have your more scholarly, humanistic uh, people. You have Pico de Mir mm -hmm. Mirandola. You have uh, Ficino and so forth. So these are definitely people that had a familiarity with the processes involved in constructing magical practices and may or may not have been engaging in it themselves. Apocryphally, there's the story of Thomas Aquinas uh, coming into the study of <clears throat> Roger Bacon and finding that he's talking with a brass head that tells the future. <laughs> Now, whether or not this actually is true, um, Aquinas ends up throwing a hissy fit and breaking the uh, device. This but is why we can't have nice things. This is why we can't have nice things, but we can always thank Baphomet because this is also a continuation of ancient cult magic dealing with divinatory skulls and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's it just fascinating. Funny you should mention that. In two weeks, we're going to have uh, Alex Rivera on to talk about Baphomet specifically. So. That It'll be a nice tie-in. Stick around for that. <laughs> so what, what um, as we transition out of the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, uh, what, what changes in terms of Christian magic? What changes in terms of Christian magic is you end up with a number of different streams of practices. You have a very, very scholastic understanding of magic, which going to, again, Ficino, is looking at what makes magic work. Mm -hmm. How does this work? How does this tie in with the classical world and whatnot? Then you have others that are inspired by trying to discover basically the spiritual mapping of the cosmos, which has always been a pursuit of religion since time immemorial. Mm -hmm. But what better way to do it than talk to the big guys themselves, above or, well, below? Right. So, so, you kind of have these two streams. Uh, they're not irreconcilable, but they definitely come from two different perspectives. One is basically applied magic, dealing with charms and whatnot, and the conjuration of spirits. One is more reserved. <laughs> this is the... Um a constant, uh, a, a constant battle of words, I would say, in the esoteric community as to what we call those things, right? Like, call it high magic and low magic, or black magic and white magic, and it's, uh, you know, all, all of these categories that people want to put on these things that end up being uh, uh, almost a little bit more trouble than they're worth. <laughs> in many cases, yes, but it's a fine, hallowed tradition, yes. and why modern magicians should definitely pick up the theology of a book on occasion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> what uh, when w during this time uh, there is still uh, you mentioned magic is still technically illegal uh, in the church and the state. So, w what kinds of uh, what kinds <coughs> of trouble were magicians seeing at this time? Well, this actually gets very very interesting. Um, much like in the Middle Ages, and well, before the Middle Ages, magic was suspect because, well, if you're a good magician, you're also likely trying to poison the king or create charms to overthrow the uh, civilization, as it were. Mm -hmm. There's also the very uh, real fear that you're going to be leading people astray and the faithful are going to be succumbing to the devil. Uh, we have to remember that it's only in the Middle Ages that we get a view of the devil as a very distinct active agent in the world mm -hmm. who is very much involved with trying to tempt the faithful. Then, like I said before, you also have uh, examples where there are pockets surviving of pre-Christian uh, pre um, practices that are very pagan. One could arguably state that while the burning times never really happened, as uh, many contemporary neo-pagans would like to imagine, thankfully that's being readdressed, mm -hmm. 
you do have examples of very real religious persecution. For example, in the Iberian Peninsula, where you have a very big, thriving, magical um, confluence of different cultures. You see these fantastic accounts of the witches' sabbats. Now, how much of that was actually Christians engaging in magical practices or pockets of surviving uh, pre-Christian, uh, usually Basque, uh, villages engaging in their religious rites mm -hmm. is very, very open to conjecture. Then you also have the accusation with the uh, Spanish Inquisition that, well, Muslims and Jews practice magic and right. that's why we have to persecute them. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that the Inquisition uh, is, a, is a whole other topic that we won't have time to get into in this video show, but I think we will definitely address that when we move on to the podcast. Um, so uh, let's, let's stop it there. Let's switch over to podcast mode and, uh, and people can get into more detail with us when that comes out. So in the meantime, where would you like to send people to find you on the internet? Um, you can find me at Michael Seb Looks at wordpress.com. That's where I do most of my writing. It's not regularly updated. You can also find me on Facebook, of course. Mm -hmm. And we'll put those links in the description of the video here. So thank you for joining us uh, for this conversation, and we're looking forward to the podcast and to part three, which is coming up uh, probably in a couple of months' time when we address uh, modern Christian magic. So stay tuned for that as well. And uh, next week, coming up on Talk Gnosis, we have Dr. Mike Estelle, who will be talking about Thelema and uh, Gnosticism and kind of the relationships and differences between the traditions. So uh, that will be an interesting conversation. Our first in-studio guest as well, so, uh, so stick around for that. And uh, for the rest of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit Patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash G-N-O-S-T-I-C.